I understand we've got about 20 minutes with you. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'm signing at 10.30, so. Okay, so, so we're going to go a little more, so I'm a little late, I apologize, everybody's checking out a little hotel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Whatever. So guys, we're going to keep this pretty casual. Uh, you've got a question, raise your hand, and we'll get to it. Yeah, so I'm going to start with the question. Uh, I'm going to ask Kevin to ask the question. Uh, what is the purpose of the Yeah, sure. Uh, it's an awesome, uh, uh, awesome question. Thank you. Is basically, I grew up in a really, really small town in Maine, and there was not a lot to do. I joke with our 12 year old son that he would say, You know, what do you, you guys, what video games do you play when you were a kid at that school? Basically, I just stayed some more until the age of 37. No, but uh, um, so I had a uh, um, Wrote my children's books, love those, love to read, and then several comics that I was on a spinner rack in a drugstore in this town I grew up in Maine, and that was pretty much it. It was, uh, it was uh, Captain America, Marvel Comics, Terrible. So I started reading those, and I became literally obsessed almost immediately. And um, I had a paper route, and so uh, uh, once a month, I did get a net out of about $2.75 $2. a month um, delivering papers. I had to go down and that's when comics were 15 cents a piece, so I could get as many comics as I could get at 15 cents a piece and save enough money to get a Yoo-Hoo and a Twinkie. Read half the comics on the steps of the drugstore, then ride my bike home and uh, read the rest at home. And that was it. And I started drawing almost immediately. Uh, my mother, my grandmother was a painter. She used to watch as my dad used to do a lot, so it was an inherited talent. But I literally became obsessed. I would be tracing panels and um, specifically my uh, my number one on hero was Jack Kirby, and that was that was sort of the man to me. Like everything connected in my twelve-year-old brain, ten, eleven, twelve-year-old brain, that was that was the man to me. I want to be Jack Kirby. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So, um, thank you so much. Generations worth of turtles. Um, I've been reading for a long time. My question is. Out of all the different incarnations of the turtles that we've seen involved in all of that, is there a certain one that you are favored of? And is there one that you'd like to see go past your your life? Because let's face it, the turtles are going to live on long, long past you. I mean, is there one that you want to see like make it further on? Or what's your favorite version of the turtles? So it's, it's a great question. And, and uh, you know, it was the, the first, you know, setting aside the, the very first um, black and white comics that Peter and I did, because that was really. You know, we had no idea, um, let's see, we had no idea what we were doing, but when we were surprised when the first issue started selling, and then we, I mean, literally, I, I worked summers uh, cooking lobsters in Maine, and we had our 94 days of summer, trying to make enough money to get through the winter, and uh, so we worked hard all summer, and, and uh, when we did put up the first issue, it was May of 1984, which actually, this May was the very good the anniversary. The anniversary, and you posted that picture of Michelangelo, which is really <laughs> love that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we, when the first issue actually sold, we were kind of shocked. And even when we got into, I worked that summer and we got into the fall of '84, and uh, Pete called me, and, and um, I was a man who was an answer. And he said, "People keep calling and asking when we're going to do a second issue," and we were like. <laughs> the or first issue. number one is coming. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, yeah. We knew what I would do the, the second issue, so he came up with that story, and, and I love um, this part of the story. That in 1985 we got the orders back for issue number two, issue number two, the Turtles, and there were 15,000 copies. The first um, issue was 3,000 copies, and he called me all excited, and he had done some quick calculations. He said, you know, after we get a print from all the bills, and this will make about two thousand dollars each. Um, pre-tax uh, on, on issue two, you know, we did, we did like six of these a year, um, we did air rent, you know, rent, rent, cheese and one, and for a comic show living. Uh, and that to me is, you know, out of the entire history of the Turtles, so many blessings, so many awesome things that happened in the history of the Turtles, but that was uh, when the dream came true for us, that's when we, quote unquote, became Jack Kirby, we were officially drawing comic books for a living. Um, I think I was 22, I'm 56 now, um, and I've been drawing comic books for this entire time, which is mind-blowingly awesome and cool. But to your question, <laughs> um, so the first black and white version uh, was my favorite. That of all things, the animated series with toys, um, and I always point to the first Turtles movie as my favorite. Um, Turtles uh, entertainment sort of exploration. So with the puppets and the Jim Henson work. Jim Henson, mm -hmm. because it was, um, <laughs> Director Steve Barron, um, who pulled off a miracle, because you know we've done the, um, you know, the, the 
comics and toys were just you know, glorified comics and animation, so it's still you know, sort of 2D. Uh, the toy bringing them to life on the big screen was like, it was really scary. I mean, because you know, we've all seen bad you know, monster movies where they put, you can see the rubber suits, and I love them. Howard the Duck. Uh, yeah, Howard the Duck. <laughs> so we were afraid we had to be perfect. We didn't believe the characters, and, and the whole thing would fail. Um, but Steve Barron came in, um, and he brought with him Jim Henson to build the costumes, which was, you know, a Christmas miracle to us. Um, but Steve really liked our first meeting with him. He had one of those large collections, the first 15 issues that Peter and I did. And he'd gone through and he sort of marked out what story he wanted to tell. You know, the first issue, Leonardo one shot, issue 10 and 11, and bits and pieces of other ones. Um, and then on top, so it was based on solidly on the original black and white comic books. But then humor element of you know, pizza and all the other stuff that came from the cartoon show. But it was a nice blend of those old, you know, Popeye cartoons or, you know, Bugs Bunny, where you had something for adults and you had something for the kids. So I'd like to see, you know, and actually it hoped when we did the most recent version of the Turtles. Um, there was actually a lot of discussion before the 2014 movie came out. In 2006, in the 2014 movie, we actually had conversations with uh, Brian Henson, Jim Henson's son, about going back to that right. history with you know Hanson, Peter Graphics, and we really hoped that that would have been the way they went, but they didn't. Mm. So, yeah, no, those bastards. So yeah, let's see if we could do another version of uh, that first movie, maybe updated in the sense that if the turtles were smaller, we kept the same heart and soul of the family aspect, it had a bit more edge to it, and. Um, you know, so I think these audiences today were so much more mature, um, so I think you could put a nice edge on it without going too far and still tell a great story. So I don't know the safety of that. So we'll start here. You know, um, where did you, the you, idea for the turtles come from? <laughs> the turtles are um, my favorite story. And, um, uh, Pete and I used to share a little studio in uh, over in Hampshire. It was actually him and his wife were renting a house, and I was renting a room from them. And our studio was the living room, so we called it Mirage Studios because it was a Mirage. Um, and I used to laugh at me because he liked these, um, um, I thought, bad, bad TV shows like the AT and the TT Hooker and all that. So I thought it was my important duty to annoy him as much as possible while he was watching his favorite shows. Um, so uh, one night I had this weird thought, because I was a huge fan of Bruce Lee, and I thought, if Bruce Lee was an animal, what would be the stupidest animal? <laughs> <laughs> Bruce Lee would be, so I thought I was a slow moving turtle, fascinating martial artist. And so I did this sketch um, turtle standing upright in this pose, with nunchucks strapped to his arms, uh, had a mask on, and I kind of put it on a strong board and said, you know, This is going to be the next big thing. Uh, um, and he just laughed, and that was our barometer. So then we got silly, and so he did a sketch, <laughs> changed some things. And studio went on the show by um, and taught his drawing. So I did a pencil sketch of uh, four turtles, uh, all different weapons. And I put this comic book, you know, Ninja Turtles logo, and gave it to him. And when he inked it in, he had a Teenage Mutant to the title. And we looked at this drawing. This was like November 1983. And we just said, this is the, this is the dumbest thing we've ever seen. <laughs> uh, we, we absolutely have to tell a story that uh, how these characters became the Teenage Mutant Ninja, Ninja, Ninja Turtles. Um, so we started writing the story in by December of 83, worked on it all through the spring of 84. And uh, at this time, we had already collected enough rejection letters for Marvel DC, just like any publisher we submitted our work to. Um, but we were lucky that there was this wonderful movement of uh, self publishers like uh, Dave Sim was doing a book called Cerebus, um, Wendy Division P was doing Elfquest, um, Flaming Characters, based on old underground black and white publishing. So we said, look, we love this idea. You know, let's keep it for ourselves. Let's write it for ourselves. Even if we sell 10 copies, we still fulfill the dream and we love these characters and, and we want to see them out there in the world even if everybody hates them. So we did early really crowdfunding from uh, my mom, my dad, my uncle, who gave us the most. We had enough to break the first, first 3,000 copies. And, um, and holy, yeah, 34 years ago, let me adjust my independence so long. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you. All right, so you, since you have been in the industry for over 30 years, how have you had to change your own styles based on everything going from like print to digital, moving onward with technology? Zero. I think I'm not that smart. <laughs> um, no, I, I have such a great appreciation for, um, I've done a lot of work in, in animation and I love, um, 
you know, the guy at night, the last I worked for a studio called Blur, and he's kind of the client and why not and how this is satiques and things and stuff. It's just mind-blowing, fascinating. I mean, my iPhone, I think, still runs on Steam or Coal or something. Um, but to me, but more importantly to me, it was, um, there was just something about the, the physicality of, you know, pen to paper or pencil to paper. You sort of feel a certain drag when you're drawing, and, and, um, and I like the idea that even at the end, you know, I appreciate it. Somebody that creates this incredibly beautiful work of art on the computer, somebody can never imagine layers and skill and, and such a great appreciation for it. But at the end of the day, there's no original art. And that to me was always um, important when I, you know, um, my father um, loved, loved museums, so he used to take us to the museums a lot. I loved um, looking at the art. Art history was my absolute um, favorite subject, even in high school. And that's one of, like, one of the most asked questions is, what did you know the names of the turtles? And um, I was such a big fan of, um, especially art history. In 1980, when I graduated, um, I did this huge mural in my school. As a graduating senior, did a bunch of murals. And mine was my tribute to Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and so we did, actually, when we were um, uh, um, sitting around bantering about the origin story, what should we call these guys? It was sort of, well, Traditional Asian names seem the most appropriate because the Asian martial arts history and stuff. And we're like, nah, it's Ninja Turtles. It's, it's, it's much, we must be able to put much sillier than this. Got Bob, Steve, nah, not silly enough. And so I just blurted out what we call them um, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael, and Pete. Wow, it turned out was it. And I love the story where <laughs> I tell them they're my slideshow. Was, um, uh, Donatello is uh, almost named Bernini because I like Bernini as a sculptor much better than Donatello. So we have like a two-week discussion. Uh, it, it was Donatello was almost named Bernini, but I think it coin toss one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 I love the technology. I think any tool um, that you use to paint, whether it's a, you know, a trowel or a brush or a, uh, a pen or a stick or a computer, it's all tools that you use. And, so I love your current run on IDW. How did you get started with IDW? And did you ever imagine it would become the longest running TMNT series? No, in fact, we were really scared when we started doing the first issues. But more points, I sold my rights um, in the Turtles probably almost 20 years ago. Um, and then Pete, a few years later, about five or six years later, sold to Viacom. And then, oddly enough, when the turtles started making resurgence with the floating, getting the rights to the cartoons, um, I started working initially with Paramount on the movie. They brought me into consult. And um, IDW acquired the rights to the turtles' consoles. I know Ted Adams and Robbie, the co founder of IDW, um, was 20 years ago. And so they called and said, Look, we've got the rights to the turtles. You want to come down and you know, get involved and consult? And, <laughs> Talk to uh, Tom Walsh, who's a writer. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. You know, I didn't, you know, the turtles were never very far from me, but it's, you know, I hadn't physically worked on them in any particular capacity in quite some time. So I went down, and, and Tom Walsh, who deserves um, 100% of the credit for what's become the IDW universe and that the origin story of um, you know putting the turtles, making able of um, scientists again, putting them in. Um, the laboratory, how he splintered in them, the reincarnation aspect. There were so many different things that he surveyed, you know, the black and white comics, the animated show, the 2000 series, which was his favorite, some of the movies, and he had this idea to keep all the important heart and soul and the family aspect and everything that he loved about Turtles, like create a platform where we could pull characters from different universes, Turtle universes, and bring it to this new one. And I, I just looked out and I thought it was absolutely fantastic because, you know, a fresh idea after even at that time was, you know, after like 25 years of, 26 years of doing it. And I said, this is going to be either a huge hit, fans will love it, or they're going to all come to our house and drag us in the street, beat us up, <laughs> mess it up. Um, but fortunately, you guys, the fans, um, really embraced the first 12 issues. We didn't think it, you know, we were hoping, we planned for 12, and we hoped that it might go a little bit further than 12. Um, but the sales were tremendous, the response was tremendous. Um, the, uh, Artists that uh, we brought in to work on the series, Dan Duncan initially, um, guys like um, you know 
Corey Smith, Mateo Santuglo, um, all these guys that have come to work on the series. And Tom's written out of, I think we just finished issue 87. Um, I help go plot, help go write. Tom does all the heavy lifting, he does all the final strips. He's written every single issue of the ongoing series. And so we started bringing these guys that were, <laughs> I meet these artists that were, um, you know, 25, 26. Um, grew up on the turtles. Um, they, you know, they come to me and like you know, um, talk to me like I used to talk to Jack Kirby every time. I met him, which is just a whole of fandom. You know, like, I love you. Like, the reason I'm drawing comic books. I'm like, shut up, you guys. Um, but <laughs> these kids, like, um, are so talented, and um, you know, the kindness that they showed me, and, and I get to work with them. So inspiring. Me. I love them dearly, but I also hate them because they literally all draw better than I do. They're not funny. <laughs> But it's such a great family. I mean, guys like Mateus, he's been offered huge series for Marvel DC. He's like, I want to draw turtles. I love turtles. And a lot of the guys that could go and have done other stuff for the company, they don't have to the turtles. They put so much into those issues, and, and the fans are still hitting it. So we we just finished um, these issue eighty seven. Um, I think issue eighty four just came out. But we have very specific plans on issue one hundred, which is going to be. Absolutely mind blowing. So, yeah, can you divulge yeah. anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> I know you see it find me and you drag me out of the street and you don't talk too much. But, um, it's kind of like that. I will say that it's kind of like a tribute to um, the last one of the Rise Rounds that you and I did, which is called City of War. Mm-hmm. So, starting in issue 89, 90, we'll start a run called City of War and run through issue 100, which will be a double size issue late. Uh, issue 50 was. So it's, I have the best. Absolutely the best time in that series. It's the closest thing that I think we'll ever get to the original Rock series, and nothing will ever replace that. But the fact that um, tonally, attitude, edge, um, it was really written for um, the original fan base or the new older audience. It wasn't, you know, um, written down for like, hey, we should either track kids. And they're like, no, the story, Nicky Nickelodeon's been. You know, they had final approval of this, and they've been so supportive. They've always been like, you know, we want you guys to, you know, keep that edge, let it evolve as it evolves. And they never came to us and said, hey, you know, I think, you know, this this character is really popular. We need to have sales. Let's bring this character. And it was always, um, especially Tom and Bobby and myself with Nick Lug, it was always story for story first. So when we brought Bob and Roxy in with the twist that we did, and leather, it's always, um, it's such a, such a nice, awesome ride. So, and I just want to make it to 100. Um, I saw all the fans of the ride. It's so, nice. Uh, let's go there first. So, yeah, maybe. so, to touch on what you were talking about, how you inspired young people, mm-hmm. what is it still like after all the years to come across a little kid in a turtle? <laughs> I mean, is it still just blow your mind? Are you used to it? Never used to it. Oh, beyond satisfying, mind blowing, humbling. I mean, you know, the fact that, um, you know, I, I'm turning red, you know, it's, really, it's sort of like, you know, I feel like, um, um, I, I just I see myself in that because I was that little geek, that little kid that I loved what I loved and the things. And I love the fact that, you know, you start from the beginning, so little, we've done yeah, interviews where the person would say, um, so you plan this to be a huge kid's day from day one, right? And say, you, you, can, you can never, ever, ever plan anything like that. And the fact that it worked as a comic book that evolved that original series, because even Pete and I were, were highly skeptical when the first uh, cartoon show came in together, we did you know, five episodes, and the toys came. And if the toys came after they saw the response to the cartoon show, the fact that this generation of young kids uh, at that time, probably 88, 1988 specifically, found it was like, that he did this hit right away. We were like, we don't know why. I mean, um, but there's something about it. And then the heights of the success. And then, I mean, we, Peter and I worked on 300 cartoon shows and all the movies. We had final say and approval over all the toys, all the shows, um, all the movies. And it just kept going. And when, even when you're in the middle of that, you don't know what you've done until you step out into a convention. And all the same to, uh, it was probably back in the, the convention back in those days were really fun because you have, say, a young version of the interview, say, six, seven, eight, and then a parent. Uh, so the young person is really excited to meet you, you get an autograph and stuff, and the two parents, uh, the parents are really angry at you because you can read their mind and they're going, 
Do you know how much money I spent on the stupid music circles or um, how, many, how many Christmas Eves I spent trying to put together the Technodrome or the Rexer and the Millennium stuff on the United States of the slashes. It was a piece. Um, but, um, and so then it worked and then it, you know, um, it had its life and it sort of went into a, a valley that just sort of was chugging along and then when Big Viacom brought it back, um, we were, it was all a huge question mark. It says, as I always say, you can't, you know, you can never tell a child what's cool unless not uh, they decide for themselves. And the fact that when they re released the cartoon series and, and the comics, it just captured their imagination again. I you know, don't know why, but it's something about them that these kids. So when I see at this convention, like, you know, you hear every convention, it's like um, whole families, dresses, uh, turtle characters, um, you know, they'll have a uh, a dad or a mom, uh, usually a dad, especially from those days, will have like some dog ear shoot up, beat up turtle toy or comic book, and they'll be apologetic. They'll put on the table and say, Sorry, this is all I have for you to sign. And I'm like, this is, the, this is the highest compliment I could ever receive is that you have this all this time. It's well loved, it's not used and abused or beat up. All my comic books that I have from my kid were all the same condition and same, you know, uh, embrace. And then you have this young person dressed. You know, a four, five, six year old kid goes to the drill class, and it's just heartwarming and uh, it's pretty much emotional, and it's very, very cool, very humbling. Very cool. Thank you. I see the gentleman way in the back, not a deep, my friend. Uh, to play off of that uh, and the generational impact, when did it hit you that uh, your creation had become a part of pop culture? Was it seeing them up on the extreme, or they you know, sought reference somewhere else? When did it really hit you? <laughs> It's funny, it's sort of a, three funny moments. Um, one was, uh, um, I remember like telling my mom and my dad that, you know, we're doing these toys for the cartoon show, and you know, she's like, you know, yeah, sure you are. <laughs> Until it was, uh, back in those days, I'm a TV guy. Um, when it actually was listed as a TV guy as, it was going to air between Christmas, uh, 1987 Christmas, uh, the kids, uh, our school break between 87 uh, Christmas and, and New Year's 1987. And so mom called, she goes, I saw your show, it was you were lying, you know? And so, uh, <laughs> and then the uh, other one was uh, when the toys came out in 1988, it was on June, and Pete and I went to uh, uh, the big toy store chain at that time, it was um, uh, toy, uh, Katie Toys. And the closest one was in Springfield, so we went down to Springfield. Because um, we heard the toys were out, we didn't believe they were actually at stores, so we wanted to see for ourselves. So just about the time we arrived to the uh, action figure aisle in KB Toys, this mom was dragging this young boy out of, the, out of that section, and she was saying, no, I'm not buying any one of those stupid Ninja Turtles. Uh, <laughs> and Pete and I went, oh, no. <laughs> 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 um, And then uh, I had my grandma call, uh, um, I think it was a couple of years or so later, just even so Scott and Aaron saw she never really watched cartoons, but she was watching Jeopardy, and the turtles were one of the questions on Jeopardy, so she was very proud. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was moments like those, because you know, even in the early days, <clears throat> that when that stuff was just starting and, and picking up, we were working like some of the shows and the, and the toys, and we were, you know, we were, you know, 80, 90 hours a week. It was all you, so when you're in the middle of it, you don't sort of realize what's going on until you sort of step outside and, and um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty insane. But those little moments that you sort of make you stop and go, what? <laughs> Dude, this is cool. <laughs> yes, sir. So I was curious with the origin story of the turtles. You did this not towards the origin of Daredevil. Oh, yes. Uh, so I was yeah. there's a story uh, between the brainstorming process of when you came up with Sure, but no, it's, uh, it's, they say it's still a joke, but also at the same time that we, with that first issue, we really did it as a parody, again, assuming that we're going to write something for ourselves and for all the things that we love um, about comics uh, and like about certain comics. And I was a huge fan of Daryl from very young. <clears throat> you know, I loved uh, more grounded superheroes, Batman, Daryl, Captain America, um, uh, those kinds of, of characters. But Daryl, which for me was one of my my favorites, and um, I still remember um, you know, 158 when they brought this new pencil and Frank Miller, and, um, you know, and I had some nice pretty good. Um, and then, you know, he blew uh, all our minds for the next, uh, next 
these three issues. So, um, and, you know, Ronnie was one of my favorite uh, experts, at least in the fact. He's been a huge inspiration to me. And so, um, when we come out with the origin story, we were like, all right, how does it work? And we love the fact that, you know, Jack Kirby origins for um, Fantastic Four, the Hulk, you know, it's always rage and gamma rays or some other serious substance that mutated them. And so I went into the other words and said, Pete, you know, after young Matt Murdoch was hit with that cancer in the eyes in the original comic book, they never said what happened to the cancer. And so the turtle work that we kept it the same, you know, blind man steps on the street, truck going through the uh, streets of New York City, carrying radio radio up waste, of course. Um, young Matt Murdoch, the young boy comes up to save the man, the truck locks up the brakes, the cancer comes free, gets him in the eyes, and we have to continue bouncing down the street, and this poor boy, you know, half a block down is hanging precariously close to a sewer opening that's open in the whole gate for area before turtles in it, you know, just smashes down into the sewer and so around. Um, and we're like, yeah, that works. Um, and uh, Marvel will probably put a sewer bus off. <laughs> um, and then went further in that, um, especially specifically from the Frank Miller run, he introduced um, Stick as his uh, mentor, so we have all his splinter. Um, they had a hand, which is a full inch clamp, we have a foot, and so on and so on. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was, it was, you know, so it was like um, little new mutants, little Kirby, a little dear hole, which is a dear hole. Um, you know, was, was sort of, and my other, one of my popular questions that's asked um, is how do you come up with the shredder? And uh, the story is um, true. It's. Uh, Pete's wife was an amazing cook. She cooks dinner and we do dishes. This particular line, Pete was washing and I was trying, and it was a, one of those metal cheese graters. Um, and I was slid my hand up the side to drive me inside, and I was holding onto the handle of the cheese grater like this. I'm like, wow, you imagine a bad guy with one of these? He would like literally like shred your skin off. Um, and this would be great for our bad guy to have this. And people say, yeah, we can call him a shredder. And so the shredder came out. Doing dishes. Lots of bits and pieces. One more, guys. Oh, one more. And yeah, I'll do uh, you again, and then I'll talk to you real quick, and then they're going to throw us out here. All right, Matthew, we're sitting at a picnic or barbecue, just relaxing, eating rats, solving problems in the universe. What would you say is the most important thing in life, and how does that show up in your work? Family, hands down. It's sort of like, you know, it's really, you know, because I have a, um, a large family, you know, it's kind of Catholic family, so my mom was like a producer, she only had four kids, so we, her sister had seven, our aunt had nine, so just simple as get together, just a massive amount of people and family, and it was just such love and, and passion from all these different um, kinds of people, and it was just, it was great, so we, you know, that kind of evolved, and as you grew up and you work, like, you know, I was working in a lobster restaurant, I worked in, um, the people you work with become your adopted family, they become your friends, your confidants, and things. And so with the Turtles, it was, you know, four mutants and the surrogate father, um, a sister figure with April, Casey Jones, a crazy cousin, a crazy brother, but we tried to always keep that heart and soul. That was a, an adopted family, you know. And that's something, you know, uh, Tom, like in the new series specifically, that was the first thing he said is that out of every version of the Turtles that you've done, it always comes down to that that core family that supports each other, and you can always count on them when it shifts down. So I say that that's, that's the most important aspect of for me, and that's what I want the message to be with the Turtles. What do you and what about that? So did you ever envision the Turtles past their teenage years, you know, like old man Leonardo? <laughs> and um, if so, is there a story that you always wanted to do for the Turtles and you never got to? There was actually um, this is a story that Pete and I started writing uh, many, many years ago, even um, I think in the very early years of some of the success of the, the cartoon shows. We, we called it the, the final story of only four. Um, it was something that we gave them birth and we wanted to sort of have an issue where it just would be the, you know, not the final, final, but sort of them 50 years later. Right. It would be, and, and I still have all the notes on that, but that will ever um, see the light of day, I'm not sure. Um, but um, I joke now because I think it's really funny. I have three little wiener dogs, um, and they're about 15 years old, and the, I call them the Golden Girls because they're like they're so spoiled um, and they're so lazy. And it is, I always thought that it'd be funny if you did a sitcom like um, Seinfeld or Big 
Bang Theory or something where the turtles were living in an apartment in New York City and it's kind of like the turtles, it's like the Golden Girls, you know, like, you know, and, you know, <laughs> this and that. I just thought it would be a funny vision and that will probably never happen, but um, uh, it'd be funny though. Um, um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's curiosity that, you know, uh, uh, we've gotten this far in the history of turtles and that it's still going and the fan base is so strong. And I, you know, it's the first time I made it to the show, um, and I'm always thrilled that, you know, because I always joke that I wouldn't stand in line to see me. 